All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Father Mark Mary, joined by Father Pierre Toussaint and Father Agostino. Uh, for the most part, I'm just introducing it, beginning with a prayer, and then I'll kick it over to, uh, to my brother priest here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we're united in your name as your sons and daughters. We love you. We bless you. We trust you. And we need you. We beg your grace to anoint this time together, that we may speak truth, that we may have open hearts, and that this may be part in the building up of your kingdom. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So give us a second. We'll kick it over to these guys. Hello, 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 everyone. What's going on? My name is Father Agostino. I'm Father Pierre Toussaint. I am a Franciscan priest, Franciscan Friar of the Renewal. I am currently stationed in Patterson, New Jersey, New Jersey in the house. Mm, and I'm here in the South Bronx, uh, Our Lady of the Angels. So what's up? Boogie down. Let's go. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're, we're, we're going to be taking this time to discuss some, some very you know, sensitive issues, some, some things that are very close to a lot of people's hearts um, through this platform. And I'm very grateful to all the people at Ascension Presents to, 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 to uh, see the importance of this issue, especially in the hearts of the young people. Uh, I've had a lot of young people you know, tell me, like, you know, what is, what is the church saying? What is the church doing? And this is definitely one thing that we could be doing. All right, we're trying, we're trying here because you know, oftentimes we look to different places to find where should we go in, the, in this specific time. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to at least have a conversation, start talking about these things, being open minded and just listening to each other, you know, so. Um, and uh, just to say that we are going to be doing Q&A's, um, I'm going to share a, a little word. Father PT is going to share a little word, but we really want to hear your questions um, and, and try to try our best to, to bring some sort of answer to them. So so um, that sounds like a plan. Yeah. Um, my brothers and sisters, uh, peace and blessings. The word, the word that I was feeling uh, really overall comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I want our land to be healed. And there's a direct connection here in this scripture verse between um, the healing of the land and, and my personal response to conversion, um, to pray, to seek his face, to turn from my wicked ways. And, and I just wanted us to ponder that for a second before we even go in. How am I humbling myself, seeking his face, turning from, from my wicked ways? Now you might say, well, I'm not that wicked. I mean, like, you know, like I haven't been to confession in a long time, but like, you know, like, but, but even still conversion is a process that is constant. And this is what the word that I feel um, as a priest, I need to be speaking out to everybody, but most especially to all my Catholic brothers and sisters. Uh, racism isn't new. Uh, some people say that there is no racism. And, and with all due respect, uh, there was racism from, from the get-go. Uh, Jesus experienced racism. Oh, yeah. So in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, uh, Jesus sent some of his disciples to a town in Samaria. Now, Jesus is going around uh, preaching all over the place, and he says, let's go to this town. And all the disciples probably looked at each other. It's like, oh, no, no, we don't go to that town. I'm like, no, we want to go over there and start preaching it up. Um, and the, the word of God says, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But the people would not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to bid fire come down from heaven 
and consumed them. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Lord, we're going to call fire down from heaven. You just gave us authority to, to cast out demons. We're going we're, we're to take it one step further, James and John said. And we're going to call fire down because how dare they? How dare they treat you like this, Jesus? These, these people are being racist. And it was, it was true. So there's a whole history with the Samaritans and the Jews that goes way back. It went back hundreds of years there was real animosity and it had to do a lot along religious lines, but also political and militaristic lines. They went to war against each other. They, they had different beliefs of how the same scriptures were meant to be interpreted. One said Jerusalem, another one said another hill. And there's this whole history behind it. And uh, it was complicated. And, and Jesus tried to go into a town where his kind wasn't accepted and he was rejected. Pause just one second to know that Jesus experienced racism too should be some sort of consolation to all of our brothers and sisters who are hurting right now. We all should be disgusted and, and frustrated and disappointed at the murder of George Floyd and so many others. But there's some people that experience bias, racism, uh, preference, uh, or on the other side of preference, every single day of their lives. And I, all, for all of you people who feel that, who experience that, Jesus experienced racism too. But, I, but the response of the disciples was just like, yeah, come on, breathe fire now. And a lot of times that's our reaction. Oh, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are for treating me like this? How dare you is our response. And Jesus rebuked them and went to another village. This isn't the end of the story. My brothers and sisters, the fire that was called down in Potencia by James and John uh, when they experienced prejudice uh, was, was actually something that was in the mind and in the heart of God, but not in the way they thought. Fast forward, James and John, they go through their process uh, they, as we hear in scripture, struggled with believing in the resurrection. They kind of came along and, 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 you know, saw the ascension. They, they, they saw Jesus die in the cross, raised on the third day, went through their process, saw him ascend uh, in the ascension and received the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. Oh, it was beautiful days. Everybody was one. It was just oh, amazing. All these people converting. And then what happened? Persecution happened crisis was going on. There was this guy named Saul who God had plans for as well. And he started throwing Christians in jail, bringing them in chains, busting down doors. The church had to scatter. And there was another racial tension that was the, the deacon solution. There was, there was tension in the early church. Newsflash, there was tension. It was racial tension in the early church the Greeks were mad at the Hebrews because they were getting more food for their widows. It, 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 you know, and they said, okay, you deacons, you guys figure this out. One of the deacons was Philip. And he fled because the church was being persecuted. He fled and he went to a town in Samaria. And I love it. And this is in, in Acts. So Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and Acts. So he knew what was going on. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse uh, chapter 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what was said by Philip when they had heard him and saw the signs which they did. The Holy Spirit came down upon the Samaritans, and it was through a crisis that, that Philip went over there. My prayer, my brothers and sisters, is that all this crazy 2020 stuff going on will lead us to renewal, will lead us to, uh, there may be a revival in the faith, uh, a turning back to God, not just by the ones who are already going to church, but by everyone there. God loves all his children and desires them to be with him, but we are so far from him. There are many wicked things that happen in our world, 
in our country. I pray that the Holy Spirit will come down upon us in this land. Now it says in verse 14, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. So John, the same guy that experienced this racism, was like, what? This crazy. Who do you guys think may fire come down and consume you guys? Well, fire came down. But it wasn't to consume them for destruction. It was to consume their hearts for conversion. My brothers and sisters, let us pray in these times where people are hurting, people feel disillusioned. Let us be those instruments. Let us be Philip that goes and nobody thought the Samaritans would come to God, but he went out there and he was an instrument. Let's be those instruments. Let us humble ourselves, pray and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways. Then he will, God will hear us from heaven and he will heal our land. Lord, Lord heal our land. Amen. <clears throat> that's my word, Father. That's you, it? That's, well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that, Father Augustino. I just like to pick up on something you said, uh, yeah, specifically today, right? Just in where, the context that we're living. If we look at 2020, it's been a, a crazy year. I mean, it's been nuts, coronavirus and all the different things going on now with George Floyd. But the Lord, the Lord has called us here as Catholics to be here present today. Um, he didn't call us to be Catholics in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. So what is the Lord doing today in my life? What is the Lord, what's going on right now for us? I just like to start there. Um, I think the Lord is calling us deeper into unity, deeper into unity. And if you want to look at the coronavirus, right? A bunch of us had to stay at home with our family members, which might've been a good thing, which might've been a bad thing, but it was a chance for us to go deeper to experience the person in our family maybe that we got along with in an even deeper and more beautiful way or maybe even to that person that we had difficulty with okay i need to just press into this relationship lean in and see if i can somehow overcome these things because i'm stuck with them for the next couple of months even too you have a chance right to reach out to people maybe you haven't connected with for a long time in this corona slow down pause time and so once again unity and just asking the lord where are you at in this situation I think really in this whole George Floyd situation, the same thing is true. Um, just in the weeks up to this, right, we were reading out of the 17th chapter of John. And that's one of my favorite, favorite chapters in all of scripture, um, just because it talks about the beautiful relationship of the son and the father. And Jesus is there and he's saying, you know, father, thank you. Thank you for these men in front of me. They are your gift to me. And I wish that they would they would experience the same unity amongst each other that we have. And that's what the Lord wants for us in our lives, um, specifically as a church, specifically as a people, specifically as those who are called to love him. Um, and that, that unity of the Father and the Son we're about to celebrate and the Holy Spirit we're about to celebrate in Trinity Sunday coming up. And right, the Father pours out everything, everything he has to the Son. And the Son, in one word, pours everything back to the Father, holds nothing back. That love is radical. It's it's totally self-giving. It's not calculating, but it's it's pouring out everything. And from that, the Holy Spirit comes, right? And Jesus invites us, love one another as I have loved you. And so once again, can I imitate that love of the Son back to the Father? Can I imitate the love of the Father back to the Son? And can I just love another person the way that God has loved me? Um, not holding anything back of himself, not approaching a situation where you know, I'm going to calculate, I'm going to be a little bit off put by something that somebody else says, but I'm going to be there with them. And I think the truth of this all, it, like you said, it, it's manifested in Pentecost. It's manifested by the burning spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by the burning fire resting on top of the apostles where Peter walks out, you know, after denying the Lord, he, he busts the door open and he's like, hey, let me tell you about what happened with Jesus Christ. And people are looking around like, wait a minute. This guy's from such and such place, but we're from another place. We can understand him clearly because the Holy Spirit breaks down walls that we put up as men. He destroys the Tower of Babel that we've constructed so that we can once again understand our brother or sister who was with us. And I think that has to be our prayer as Catholics, our prayer as Christians, 
that, okay, Lord, you have constructed, you have sent out the Holy Spirit, and we have constructed these walls. Help me to see past that. And it's beautiful because a part of this whole process, a part of everything, is listening. Um, listening in prayer, first and foremost. We have to go to the source. We have to go to the well spring. Like the Samaritan woman, you brought up Samaria. Like the Samaritan woman, Lord, give me this water. <laughs> you know, um, And Jesus says, if you realized where this water was coming from, you wouldn't ask me. And so it's something where we have to be able to listen to the Lord, um, listen to what he's, what he's telling us, listen to where he's pushing us. And ultimately, then in conversation, then in sitting down with somebody else, um, specifically somebody of a different race, hey, what's your experience? How are you feeling? Just dropping all preconceived ideas, preconceived notions, preconceived things that we bring to the table and just listening before anything else, before making a judgment, before um, yeah, saying that this is this or that's that. Just, okay, just the same way that the Father, or the Father poured out everything from the Son and he received it. He received it without you know, changing anything. The same thing we should receive our brothers and sisters. Okay, I'm just going to listen. And I might not understand every single thing or maybe even agree with every single thing that you're saying. But because you're my brother or my sister in Christ and I love you, I'm going to listen to you. And sometimes laying down our life um, for love of our brothers and friends looks specifically like putting our pride or putting our ideas or putting whatever it is that we have as our agenda to the side. Um, Because that's difficult. It's difficult a lot of the times. And finally, <clears throat> just to invite once again the Holy Spirit into this whole conversation, this conversation here, the conversation that will ensue from this, um, just in, invite him to, yeah, to make you uncomfortable, right? Just to, to be uncomfortable with uh, your, the way you are now so that you can change. And that's, and that's for everybody, you know, because if we're, if we're comfortable where we are, then that's not, that's not good, you know? Um, Jesus didn't say, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened. Um, and I'm going to make you comfortable so you don't have to, to do anything. I will give you rest so that you can go forth and you can do great things in my name. And so ultimately, we have to invite the Holy Spirit just once again to be with us, to instruct our hearts, but more, more so um, just to stop playing it safe and to, to go out in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Peter wasn't thinking about being comfortable going out and speaking to those who just wanted to kill him or they were just hiding out of fear for the Jews. And so I think the same thing has to happen for us being caught up in that Trinitarian love and that Trinitarian um, unity, once again, just because the Lord loves us in a tremendous way. And so not as long as you, but at least <laughs> there's something there. Oh, you take the time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you did pretty good. Yeah. Amen. No, when you, were, when you were talking, Father, I was thinking of, so as priests, we, we get a class, classes on confession and how to hear confession. And I remember... Um, I had Father Haggerty. Mm -hmm. Did you have Father Haggerty? I had Father Haggerty. Uh, Father Haggerty. He just, he just uh, was just very straightforward. He's like, uh, uh, confession isn't the time for you to, you know, be talking. You got to listen, because uh, like you got to know what to forgive. Right. Right. <laughs> and I remember, I mean, it's just like, can you imagine going to confession? I'm assuming, uh, I'm maybe not everybody here is Catholic, uh, but confession is where we go. We confess our sins and we receive forgiveness and it's called the sacrament of reconciliation but like if you went to confession like this priest like just did not stop talking and just like you walk in like oh you know this is that this is the other and like oh, okay is that all your sins like oh i didn't say anything yet like that's not that's actually that's not valid you know right, like right. You, you you need to confess some things so so that you can be forgiven um and and i think that i think that our world especially our country needs reconciliation mm. i see in the comments a lot of people saying like yeah well, what about white lives what about all these other things like yeah yeah all lives mm. everybody everybody is a child of god and is loved by god but right now we have a particular community that has that that, that has been carrying a particular hurt and if you have not heard it yet by a representative of the church I want to say to all of our black brothers and sisters, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this has been the experience constantly from day one in your lives, just seemingly because of the color of your skin. It's not right. Racism is a sin and it should have no place and we need to work to eradicate it. I think all of us hopefully can agree on that. If not, we'll talk a little bit later. But we, we want to go from there as a point of departure right. 
and now answer some of these questions. All right. And just a comment about like all lives matter and all these different things. I saw somebody said something somewhere. <clears throat> like just in these days, we've all been scrolling through different news feeds or whatever it is. But somebody couched it like this. Okay, you take the parable of Jesus going after the lost sheep, right? And uh, he leaves the 99 in search of the one. And sometimes, right, like there are these movements where, okay, all lives matter and this and that. And it's like the 99 saying when Jesus is leaving, hey, we matter. Don't we matter? And Jesus is like, yes, I love you guys. I love you to death. But I'm going to go find the one that is struggling right now, the one that needs my help, the one that's lost. And so that's what, in a sense, Black Lives Matter. Okay, we understand, like, once again, all these other things are true. And as a Catholic church, we're not both and or either. I mean, we're both and not either or. And so, yes, we, we fully agree with that. But right now is the time, um, at least as a nation, as a people, to say something, to get behind this um, specific specific idea, you know? Amen. And, and with that, Father PT, there's a couple questions on this. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? It's from James. Uh, how do we share in a loving way that we don't agree with Black Lives Matter organization itself, um, but that we believe, uh, I read on the Black Lives Matter website that they support LGBTQ and PP, but that we believe Black Lives Matter uh, and B. Um, well, I mean, we can we can tag team on this. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's like you can, you can support, um, a statement, a concept, a reality that, that Black Lives Matter and, and know that your support of, of this is talking to a specific issue and not support an organization that does not hold your beliefs. I mean, we kind of do this a lot with politics already. You know, there's, there's, there's some platforms that we're not 100% on, but, but people have a couple things right. So like, okay, you know, this is usually how responsible citizenship works would that somebody would completely agree with all of the catholic teachings people ask me like oh well we you know well, well what political party you, you belong to like i say i'm catholic man i've i and, and i and i vote as a catholic and that's how that informs uh those decisions that i look for uh does it mean that we can't possibly work with an organization for common health good i would say usually yes but sometimes no because uh, it would be a bad witness. Now that said, this particular thing, everybody has a right to peaceful protest. And so those people who I do know that went for protesting and held Black Lives Matter uh, signs, um, but I know that they would not agree with the organization. And so this is a distinction that needs to be made. Yeah, I think the movement itself is not necessarily giving credence to the, the ideology behind the movement. You know, um, so if you were to say Black Lives Matter, it doesn't necessarily mean that I am everything for what the leaders of Black Lives Matter necessarily hold. Um, but that's a helpful distinction to, to bring about. And just as far as protesting, right? Like as Catholics, we protest every year peacefully at the March for Life. And so, like, once again, it's something that we do. Um, and just it's OK if we could segue into another question. Why do our people not care about the unborn being aborted? Um, that's from back in the saddle. And once again, it's not that, yeah, we, we, we didn't say, hey, Black Lives Matter, therefore we don't care about um, people being unborn children dying. Uh, we know that specifically with, with abortion, it's something that is in, it's very much tied to, to race, right? Um, and you can look at the history, look at all these different things. But once again, um, yeah, right now this is the time. This is the time to speak, specifically speak about um, African Americans and what they've been struggling. Because it's not one it's not this is not a once once off incident as far as george floyd but it's something that okay there have been there's been a kindle there like past experiences that people have gone through and this was a light this is a match that lit the fire um and, and this isn't to say once again that that lives in the womb are important because once again we're catholic and we, we believe that and we, and we hold that to the utmost dignity and oftentimes whenever we encounter um people who are because we do pro-life um counseling and stuff like that we remind them of their dignity as human people, um, not just the dignity in their womb, in the womb, but also the dignity of themselves. And so it's something that we're not making a distinction that, OK, because black lives matter, therefore unborn lives don't matter. Um, it's more of just, OK, this is the moment to speak about this. Yeah, I, I would say uh, back in the saddle that it's my prayer and hope 
that through this, many people would begin to see the lies of abortion and the inherent, uh, you know, uh, very clear uh, bias towards uh, minority neighborhoods, and the placement of, of abortion clinics by Planned Parenthood. It is heinous. Now, I'm hoping a lot of people will say like, hey, man, this isn't right that, that, that men are dying like this and that that would bring them to the pro-life movement. Actually, I, I, I began to kind of do some research. There's some awesome pro-life um, black speakers that are saying some incredible things and it's beautiful to hear it from, from, their, from their point of view. So that's, that's my hope as well, that we come to a deeper understanding, but, but one step at a time. Um, uh, is there any connection between race and abortion? Are the effects of systemic racism leading to poverty, which often leads to an increase in abortions? Um, uh, yes, uh, this, this uh, is from MM. Uh, thank you, MM, for that question. Um, this, is, this is something that we see very clearly, especially here in, right. in the South Bronx. Yeah, here in the South Bronx is black and Hispanic, and it has amongst the highest abortion rate in the entire country. Last time I checked, it was 42% abortion rate in this neighborhood where we are at. And, and the effects of abortion uh, affect the family in, 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 in horrible, profound ways. And we're trying to work to untie that knot and working with the young people and working with the families and trying to instill in them a, a notion that, yes, they can have a family, which is also something that, that plays into race. There's a lot of single parent homes, no father figure. Like these are things that we're trying to build so that there can indeed be um, uh, some sort of equality because, because this, 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 this stems from the family and there's all these things it's kind of connected. I don't have time to get into it all here and now, but yes, there is a connection and this is something that we are fighting. But once again, it's like if, if there's so much going wrong and you, you enter into a house and there's so much going wrong, you know, there's like, you know, I don't know, electricity, you know, that you got to start somewhere and, Justice, justice behooves us to start by addressing these issues here, especially with the, um, the, the murders of a number of black people in succession in the last couple of months. We have to say something. And even to just the history of, of Margaret Sanger and eugenics and all these different things, we won't get into it, but look more into that, um, specifically to see how she targeted African Americans and Hispanics, and so um, yeah, it's a part of racism. It's a part of this 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 issue. And it's a bigger question, um, but once again, we're focusing right now. On Let me just break that statement down. Margaret Sanger was the the founder of Planned Parenthood, and eugenics was the name of a movement that wanted to uh, basically do away with minorities. That is the origins of Planned Parenthood, and that's fact. You can't deny it. You can look it up. Okay, that's why we got you here. Moving on. Next that. question. <laughs> Uh, how do you recommend we pray during the scary time from Stuart? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, right, this the scary time it isn't going to change your prayer life in the sense of okay, maybe it can change your focus, but hopefully, you're still you're still praying every single day. You're connecting with the Lord. You're connecting with Him in the Scriptures. Obviously, depending on what part of the country you're at, you could go to Mass and you could you know receive communion for this and bring it as a Mass intention. But the, the hope would be, once again, that, okay, this is a time that I'm going to maybe offer up something or offer up a certain way that I'm doing things uh, just a little bit differently now for this specific intention. So I would say maybe with intentionality, okay, I'm going to pray for unity. I'm going to pray for uh, whatever it is that I think specifically that I need um, in order to engage this topic on a, on a personal level. So that way I can have the, the strength and the courage to be able to speak out when I need to speak out. Um, but even too, I would I would even say, if you saw the video we posted up earlier, um, it's just something very beautiful where if you could just invite Jesus to help you see the other person as he sees them. It's a simple prayer. It's beautiful. And it's not just for racism, but like it's when you struggle with somebody in your life that you can't forgive or it's when you struggle with a relationship. Jesus, help me see what you see and feel what you feel about this other person. And then in turn, also, too, you can pray, Jesus, help me see what you see and feel what you feel about myself. Um, and so that way, once again, you're, you're going to Jesus, you're asking him, you're inviting him, him in with intentionality to the specific situation.
because it's only with him, through him, and in him that these things will change. Amen. I like that. I was just going to say, <laughs> that's good. I was just going to say, pray for the gift of counsel. Uh, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it's the uh, gift that helps us make decisions specifically when it's difficult. And I think that kind of covers a lot of things. It's like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I know um, in my family, uh, so yeah, so my sisters, uh, one of my sisters married uh, a man from a different race, Asian. So we had to like prep all the family. Like, you know, there's certain things you just don't say. And even if we, even, even though we did that, guess what happened? You know, yeah, it still happened. And so like to have the gift of counsel is to be able to know what to say in those moments because like this is happening in real time. And so like you can be like the voice that says, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not how we say that, you know, uh, you know, or, or even when there's, when there's uh, somebody who presents, you know, a, a great difficulty, the gift of counsel will have, will, will, will help you to say like, just be, just, just be silent and listen. And I, and I think that's what we need, right. you know, that, that gift to be able to know what to do in the different situations that would face us. And then, yeah, no. next question. Uh, Father PT, uh -oh. could you speak to how this isn't just a police brutality issue, but also an issue with systemic racism, for instance, in the South Bronx, is the poorest congressional district, school funding, et cetera? Anna. Anna. Thank you, Anna, for that question. Um, yeah. And so, once again, like I mentioned earlier, right, the, the thing is just to focus in on the police brutality and George Floyd. And this is like, this is the jumping point or the match that lit the fire, if you will. Um, but racism is systemic, which, which has been part of our country, unfortunately, for, for a long time at its, at its inception. Uh, if you had a chance to look at Father Josh and Father uh, Mike Schmidt's video, they, they touch a little bit about that. And uh, it's something where here in the South Bronx, in the school systems, at, as, is, uh, as is referenced, that the school systems aren't the best. You know, like the best resources are important here. Um, and the kids are left with sometimes just inadequate reading levels or, or different things like that. And you see it played out. And so therefore they have just not the same resources of other, other uh, places do in the country. And it's a cycle that leads them so then they don't have a good education. African-American kids go out and they're not able to get as good jobs and so on and so on. And the cycle continues. Um, and Congress and the government, and this is kind of getting into a bigger issue, you know, they don't really do too much about it. And so it's something, once again, that I think we need as a people to start opening up our eyes and to see, OK, maybe I have lived my life comfortably and I have had these different things happen to me that were good. But are there people out there who are suffering in ways that I'm just not aware of, that I don't even know? Um, and so part of listening is maybe to, to do some research, to, to look at the history or even just to, to look up different places and say, OK, it's like this for me in this part of the country. But how is it in that part of the country? And can I understand why people are so um, vociferous and why are they so angry or what like what is this all about? What's all going on here? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about to say something controversial here. I guess everything is. Um, so one of the one of the demands of some of these organizations that are asking for change is that is that police forces be defunded and that money get reproportioned and, and, and um, invested in low income or, or minority neighborhoods. Now, I'm all for funding in low income neighborhoods and I'm all for keeping uh, things accountable. Everybody needs accountability. I don't care who you are. Uh, police, priests, um, everybody, firemen, yo, janitors need some sort of compliance. That's, that's just, I'm going to say that. But my thing is, is like, yo, if we're just saying that we're going to sink money and sometimes some of these programs don't help at all. We as Catholics need to look into organizations that are truly helping these minority neighborhoods be able to, to, to lift people up from, from, from all the throes of, of poverty to truly help them become uh, flourishing human beings. And I'm not convinced that just moving money around and the government is going to do that. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to my opinion. Yeah. But I think, 
how I should exhort people to look for organizations that are and support them because it's hard working in the inner city. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. So there, that's okay. There, there you go. All right. We're back. All right. Uh, how can we fully be healed until everyone agrees to not see the color of your skin by Melissa? Um, I share, share a thought. Um, yeah, Melissa, I think it's, it's ongoing conversion. Um, I, I'll, I'll confess, I have biases. I grew up in a neighborhood that was pretty much all Hispanic. And, and there's a lot of different things that, that I had never seen and I was exposed to it. I, I've gone and I, I remember the first time I went preaching in Germany and like I realized that I had these preconceived notions. But when I met the people, th those things began to fade away. And, and I realized, you know, people are people, man. People are people. People go through everything. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got issues. And if I see that first, then I think that we're getting closer to seeing things as Christ sees them. And we need to work on that. We need to expose ourselves to that. It doesn't just happen overnight. There's no magical formula. There's no pill you can take. you got to work on it. That's my thoughts on that. Yeah, oftentimes I say this like to people in the, in the uh, confessional where, like, I wish it was just easy as snapping your finger and next day it's over. You know, like whatever you're struggling with. It's a process. Like It's a process that's tough. It's a process that you go through. But the more committed you are to that process, the more committed you are to seeing it through with the invitation of Jesus, the Father, and the, and the Holy Spirit, it's going to happen. Change, real change will happen um, specifically for you and like your life. And then for those around you, um, they'll see, wow, Melissa's different. She looks and she talks in a different way about people. And I like that. There's something I want in her that I, like, I want to have for myself. And so, yeah, just to continue, continue trudging along, continue inviting the Lord into the struggle so that you can specifically be that change, so that you can specifically also um, just see that come about. Next question. Woo! We're cooking. All right. Oh, okay. Which question do we have here? Uh, how do we respond when many Catholics boil racism issues down to purely a political issue, often saying it's liberal by NB? Um, well, first of all, can we say that, you know, although the church is never going to support a particular candidate and say vote for this person, the, the church has um, a right and, and actually has moral authority to talk about political issues. Can I just say that? You know, it is OK. It is not a violation of the Constitution for the church to weigh in on these political issues, especially as they as they relate to to morals. Uh, and values, like we can talk about these things. So if it's just a political issue, but raised up by, then we can still talk about it. But it's not just a political issue. Uh, it's a moral issue. Uh, this is about something that's, that's an egregious sin. And especially when it's, when it's just encrusted into a way of life, we need to be about fighting this. I don't know, um, people have been, been putting all these pictures, you know, there's this one picture of this Catholic priest walking with Martin Luther King, and you know, and like there's, uh, there's, there's some of these figures that have, that have come up and, and, and said some powerful things in the history of our country, but like, I, I, I just read, I love history, I love history. Yeah. I was just reading the history of New York, and man, these priests, we're fighting alongside of the people that were going. There's this whole, the Nina signs, no Irish need apply, no Italian need apply. There was clear bias right here in this place. And, and it was because they were Catholic or it's because they were from a particular country. And that was wrong. And the church was right there with them saying, we're going to help you. We're going to fight with you. And the church did. And, and, and thanks be to God, little by little, there was these little... Um, uh, battles that have, were won so that, so that you know, uh, it came to the point where I remember in 9-11, I was here, I was a young friar, and um, you were probably just in diapers still, don't say anything, uh, don't say anything, and, um, and I remember New York City, uh, former mayor Ed Koch said, when this happened, I knew there was only one place to go, St. Patrick's Cathedral, he was Jewish! And he knew to go to the place of prayer, St. Patrick's Cathedral. We've come a long way here in this city. Thanks be to God. But that was because people united. This is something we need to unite over as well. Amen. 
I was a sophomore in high school, just to clear it up. Okay. okay. And um, <laughs> <laughs> just my two cents on that, just real quick. Uh, oftentimes it is boiled down to a, a political issue, but somebody said recently, this is, this is a human issue. Like it's, it's about people as opposed to what side red or blue you're on or yeah, liberal or conservative, whatever it is like, no, no, this is a human issue. Like what we saw in George Floyd is, is wrong. No matter what political leaning you have, it's not a political statement, but I'm just saying like, it's, it is what it is. You saw it. And so, um, oftentimes, yeah, different political parties inject their agendas into it, but we just want to have a, a conversation about just yeah, racism and and leaving politics and everything out of it. Um, just to talk about once again the human dignity of the person and can I encounter just God in them? So Amen. And we continue on. Uh dun dun dun. Uh I, I see a question here real quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to it just to because I think this this plays. Are you a dark skinned Chicano? No. And I'll tell you why. Okay, like I said, I like history. So the Chicano movement as a movement kind of, it started out really good, uh, but as a, as a Latino theologian said, it, it did not have any way of self-correction and it kind of fell off the rails. And really the Chicano movement as it is today is kind of pagan. It lost its Catholic roots. So I do not identify myself as Chicano. This plays a little bit into the whole, like, do I support the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, or do I, you know, like all this other stuff. So, uh, but I am beautifully colored, mm. dark skin, Latino, Mexican descent. Okay, now back to this question. How do you promote social justice as a Catholic without falling into the wrong mindset? Liberation theology. I'll let you on that one. Okay, well, um, all right. So it's just, it's just educating yourself. Yo, if you read the, the, the social justice teaching of the Catholic Church, like it's so beautiful. Um, if you can, like some people have the Ducat, which is kind of like a compendium or, or like a summary, but there's also this other document. If you're, if you're, if you're ready for the next level, the compendium of social doctrine of the Catholic church, it's, it's a big fat book. It's a little theological, but it is all there. It's so powerful to read how, how the church developed this, this teaching. Uh, we can, we can go into it. Um, I teach the friars, the novices, um, a lot of this stuff in, in, in recognizing uh, our need to educate ourselves about what the Catholic Church is teaching about, about the poor and our role in, in um, summary is, is kind of like, uh, how, do you, how do you keep from falling into the wrong mindset? You know, educate yourself from documents from Vatican.va, baby. You know, you can't go wrong with that. That's straight, that's straight from the source. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. And that's what they tell us in seminary. Every, every time we did anything, let's see what the church documents say, as opposed to going to some other books, some other commentary on it. First start with the documents. And then after that, okay, let me look more into this. Let me, you know, ask other priests, maybe that I know who I trust and their opinions and stuff like that. Hey, can you point me in a direction of a book that maybe you could give me some more insight into this specific topic? And so, yeah, bring the question up to maybe a priest that you trust, and then he could then give you some further insight into these things. If people want to start out with something kind of like straightforward, I would say Pacham and Terrace by St. John the 23rd, 23rd, um, is, is like, it's, it's straightforward. It gives you just the facts, vintage Pope John the 23rd. If you want to get a little bit more like economical, political, look at Centesimus Annus by St. By John Paul II, uh, a lot more developed, but nonetheless very important. Uh, those are just a couple recommendations. All right. Keep on. Keep on going? Okay. How do you, why do you suppose so many assume that if you're not a minority that is white, that you have racist tendencies? This makes me angry, Amanda. Uh. Well, I, I think that um, one thing that's not being mentioned, and um, so I have a number of friends who are policemen, and the stuff that I was hearing back is, is that uh, that there was a lot of people who were protesting peacefully and that there were some people that were just really doing some really wrong things. And I want to say, as a Latino, as a minority, man, that is just not helping us. Another thing that doesn't help us is to assume 
that, that everybody holds the same beliefs if they're part of a certain ethnicity. And, it, and I understand, you know, because that's what happens to us. You know, we, we get seen by the color of our skin and, and all these things get assumed. Um, I, I, was, I was just a quick story. Uh, we were talking as the brothers in, in, the, um, in, in the friary and one of the brothers got stopped. And, and uh, he, I think he was speeding, okay? This is back when we were when we used to drive before the COVID thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and he said, "Yeah, that's like the first time I got stopped." And I looked at him and I was like, "What?" And then all the brothers, who are mostly white, they all said, "Oh, I've I've been stopped twice. Oh, I've been stopped once too." And they looked at me and they said, "How many times have you been stopped, Father?" And I said, "About a hundred. Now, before you start judging me, most of the time I would just get stopped just because um, whatever all i'm saying is that it's sometimes it's hard when you you're used to that when you know that that happens you look at different people and you say oh are you going to treat me like the way that these other people treated me and that that's a wound speaking now i share that story because uh now i it's 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 a peaceful thing it's it's a, 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 I'm, I'm assured of, of, of God's peace if I get stopped, even because of the way I look. And sometimes the policemen are a little embarrassed when they realize I'm a priest, but that's another story. Um, what I'm saying in answer to this question is that when somebody says that, know that it's a wound speaking because of the way that they've been treated a lot of the times and listen through that so that there can be a peace about you and, and you can bring a deeper reconciliation between you and that person and who knows Maybe that one conversation is going to completely change the way that the person who thinks that uh, you have racist tendencies will help them see like, no, it's not all like that. Not everybody's like that. I, I'm, I'm healed through this conversation. Yeah. And it's continue on. It, it's listening. You know, like, OK, I might not be this way. This person's talking to me or putting me in this box, but I'm going to listen to them nonetheless. I'm going to listen to their experience and listen to why. They think that and then you could ask them straight out if it's in a conversation okay why like why are you coming at me this way why are you asking these questions of me because and then you could feel free to speak your piece but once again first of all it, it starts by listening um and having that peace as you mentioned you know and a follow-up question to that is should i as a catholic kneel down and apologize for a crime racism that i did not commit uh, emily thank you emily and um this is something kind of beautiful uh it says, of, right, if one of the members of the church suffers, then we all suffer. Um, and so you might not have committed the specific crime of racism, but you can kneel down and apologize specifically to the Lord on behalf of those who are committing the sin of, of racism and ask for just forgiveness for them in their hearts. Um, I heard a powerful story of, uh, of this NFL player. He was in Las Vegas doing furniture shopping or whatever it is. And um, he's yeah, and this, this, this white lady walked up to him and with tears in her eyes, she just hugged him and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry on behalf of the people of Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. I'm sorry. And he said he was moved to tears. And um, and I know they broke all COVID protocols, but that's that's neither here nor there. But nonetheless, it was a moment of reconciliation. It was healing for this NFL player that he shared it um, with everybody else. And she didn't do anything, but she apologized. And that meant something for somebody else. Maybe it's something the Lord might be inspiring you to do in a situation. But also, too, I think it's beautiful for us just to once again, when, when the body of Christ is hurting, when any, any one of the members are hurting, um, specifically in this situation, we can lift up prayers, we can lift up our hearts, and we can, we can suffer with them. We can be compassionate, suffer with them um, in this specific time. And that takes the form of, yeah, kneeling down, praying, or maybe even apologizing on behalf, like Father Agostino did, um, for people that have no idea that they're doing the things that they're doing. Um, uh, yeah, the, I do that all the time uh, in all different situations. Uh, we do a retreat in the ministry that I run, Corazon Puro, where, where a man talks to the women and he just asks for forgiveness for any time a man did something to hurt them, uh, if it was abandonment, if it was mistreating, you know, whatever it is. And oftentimes I get asked to do this and I didn't do anything to anybody, right. you know, but it, it, it's so moving to hear a man ask for forgiveness for hurts that are really real. 
And it's a very powerful moment of our retreat. I hope I didn't let the, the cat out of the bag of yeah, what we do in our retreat. I just did. I we do other things too. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so I didn't do those, those things. I didn't cause those wounds. But I'm a man and a man did. And so on behalf of men, really, really true manhood, if I could say, would, would do that on behalf of men who have hurt other people, right? And so I would, by extension, true Christianity would ask forgiveness on behalf of the whole um, to seek reconciliation. Yeah. Questions keep on coming. Um, how do we deal with friends that make such hateful statements? And friends are in quotes. Just so oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, well, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I would say that obviously uh, this is a very heated time. Yeah. And um, maybe sometimes people say things that they, they, that's, they're not in their right mind, maybe. Give them benefit of the doubt, in other words. Um, but uh, normally... A civil adult conversation is the forum to talk to friends who make such hateful statements. Um, and uh, I, I, I was speaking to somebody who was, he said something very ignorant. He's a friend of mine. He said something very ignorant. And, and I just said, you know, that's not appropriate right now. And that's all it took to diffuse the whole thing. Nobody wanted to get in an argument. Um, and uh, I'm a lot bigger than him. So maybe it was that too. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, you know, to kind of say something, um, you know, if the Lord puts that on your heart, I would caution people, um, you know, this isn't about arguing back and forth on the chat feeds. Can I just say that chat is not the normative place to talk about this? I just said Amen. it. Amen. I just said it. That's not mm -hmm. where we talk about these things. We talk about these things face to face in relationship because that's the normative way that people grow. People don't grow by posting chats. I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it's just, I got I to gotta preach. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, sometimes it's uh, specifically when it's a friend that makes a hateful statement. And you, you really want to like just give it to them. Uh, walk away. <laughs> just take a minute. Uh, just I'll be back. I'm going to go and make an excuse, whatever. I'm going to, I forgot my fish in the car. I don't know. Just, uh, just make an excuse and walk away, take a deep breath, um, and just pray, come Holy Spirit, and then to go back and say something, you know? Um, and you might realize, okay, now's the time to say something, once again, because we're in the middle of a, of a dinner party or whatever it is, or if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, okay, I'm going to go back to the table and this is how I'm going to do it. Because, yeah, it's not, sometimes we can, we can talk past each other without actually listening to each other. And specifically, if you are hurt and you can experience this, this anger um, due to a, a comment or a hateful statement, you just you just spew out venom and spew out things that don't further along the conversation. And before you know it, it doesn't get anywhere. You know, like oftentimes, I don't know if this happens to you, Father, this, you know, but like sometimes you get people, um, Christians of a different de denomination who wants to want to have a conversation with you about why the Catholic Church is wrong or why this is going on. And so, OK, cool. Let's have a conversation. But then they keep throwing Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. You're like, okay, I see that. But then they cut you off again and they keep going. And it's not a conversation. It's a monologue. And so to avoid that from happening, specifically when you are dealing with sometimes just issues or different things that people say, take some time out, take a deep breath, walk away and come back. And then as best as you can, okay, what you said just hurt me. Acknowledge it. What you said just hurt me. Can we talk about that? And because they might not be even aware of the fact that what they just said was, was hurtful to you. Um, and then just be ready to have a difficult conversation. Um, and, and that's how, once again, change happens, you know? Amen. Um, we're, we have about maybe 10 more minutes. I think we're going to go a little bit over if this, if it's okay. We're going to go 10 more minutes. So we're going to try to get some of these questions as, as, as soon as we can. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but keep on posting and we'll see what we can do right. after the fact. Okay, um, dun, dun, dun. in the moment when someone says something overtly inappropriate and you start feeling your blood boiling, what do you do in the moment to get a level head and cool down before responding or acting? What do I do? I don't say the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> and then I just say, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And that's on my best days, okay? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes on my bad days, sometimes things come out that um, I... I 
and if I say something that's I don't know that's um, that's harsh or something like that, I apologize. I say I'm I'm sorry, and um, and that goes a long way. Sometimes more so than proving a point. Yeah, it's difficult for me because. I'm kind of a phlegmatic person where like, yeah, I kind of roll easily with things, but when something sparks, like, okay, watch out. But uh, so sometimes I do just fly off the handle, if you will. Um, and sometimes I guess to, to help at least clarify this, I would maybe rephrase the question. Uh, but like, wait, did you just say this? You know, like to kind of give me a chance to think or at least to whatever it is. And they could be like, oh, oh, wait, wait, no, no. I didn't mean it that way. Um, and so sometimes helping to diffuse a situation would be just to repeat the question, rephrase it in a way to see if that's what they truly meant. And it also gives you a chance to kind of, OK, let me cool down a little bit, because uh, once again, like I just mentioned, sometimes just spewing out the venom or whatever it is, not venom, but just uh, yeah, coming out of that place of, well, this, this, that and that doesn't further along the conversation. But you could start by saying, hey, look, what you said is very hurtful and this is why. And let me, let's talk about it. Yeah, um, another. I, I used to be in the debate team in college. We would kind of like ask questions. So, so, so what did when you said this? What did what did you mean by that? Right. Uh, and okay, and then they answer like, okay, so what you meant was was this? You restate what they just stated, and it, it actually gives you time to think or cool down. So that you know, those are tips, right? You yeah. know that you okay tips. Okay, here we go. We we'll keep on going. Uh, ba -ba 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 How do we? Oh no, can we have a, a father PT. We have a question here. Father yeah. PT, how do you explain the racial dilemma in our culture to people in the church who seem to choose not to see it or are just telling or just letting it go the best way to maintain or are saying just letting it go is the best way to maintain unity? Father PT. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. And uh, and yeah, see, like I'm rephrasing the question right now so I can give myself some time to think. So yeah, it's it's acting right now. Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the racial dilemma in the church is, is real. Um, and I think we, if this, hopefully that's not a mic drop statement, but, but yeah, like if we look at the, the percentage of, of African-American Catholics in the church, it's, it's small, you know, in comparison to the growing Latino church to, um, yeah, to the Anglo church. And so uh, how do we explain the racial dilemma in our culture to people in the church who seem to choose not to see it? Yeah, as much as you can, once again, as I've been mentioning, is uh, is to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And right, it's something that if you don't want to do it, then, then you're not going to go there. But if, if once again, if there is some true, like, okay, I really feel bad for um, Susan, who's in the pew, who goes through things that I don't, I don't have any idea what, what that means. Um, I'm going to put myself in her shoes. I'm going to have a conversation with her. I'm going to ask her about specific things in her life so that I can come to understand better like what she's going through. Um, because I don't, I don't think letting things go helps with unity, you know, like um, because it, it just causes it. So if I let it go and it's, it's a real issue for me and I don't speak about it, I don't, I don't address it. Then it becomes something that I'm, I'm suppressing or repressing and it somehow it's going to come out in this, in this other way. Um, but I think, it's real and also say like there are proper venues to have these discussions, you know, like um, there are proper times and there are proper places to have these discussions. And it's, it's not like maybe it might happen in the parking lot between two people one-on-one -on -one when they are, are having a natural discussion about things. And all of a sudden they say, Hey, look, what do we do um, about this, this thing? Or let me ask you about this because this is something that's dear to my heart and you're dear to my heart and I want to know more about it. And so um, that's kind of just, an ad hoc answer to this. I don't know if I'll just, you know, you had a little bit more time. Yeah, time to think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll answer just with a quick story. So um, uh, I was I was leaving the friary and uh, heading to a meeting and, um, and a homeless guy that always comes by. He's homeless. You know, we know he has a drug problem. We've tried to help him 101 ways and he stays on the street. He's very, he's very pleasant. We always give him food to eat. Um, but uh, he came up to the car and he said, hey, hey, father, how you doing? Hi. And I was like, Hey, Sean, how you doing, man? And he said, oh, thank you for saying hi to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, and, uh, and then he said, yeah, because uh, the other day you were really busy and, um, and you didn't say hi to me. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I'm a Franciscan friar of the renewal and I didn't say hi to a homeless man. And in that moment, I don't know, this is my meditation. I had like a little 
image of me coming to the pearly gates, because it's all going to happen one day. We're all going to be judged. And St. Peter was there, and he saw me. He said, oh, oh, here he comes. Sean, come here. And he put Sean in the judgment seat. And he said, okay, how will you judge this man? And I thought, I'm going to say hi to Sean every single day, all the time. I'm going to say, hi, Sean. How you doing? I'm going to go up to him. And, um, you know, uh, when you did this to the least of my brethren, you did this to me. And Jesus puts this directly with a, a direct connection with our own salvation. If people are refusing to, to recognize this problem, then I must say as a priest of the Roman Catholic Church, open your eyes. Because when you did this to the least of the brethren, you did this to Jesus. When you did not do this, Lord, deliver us from that. That's how I would answer that question. Okay, so... Um, we got to finish up here. We got, uh, we got time for how many more? Uh, we could one quick one, two more, but we got to be quick. Okay. You choose them. You uh, okay. Sorry, guys. Um, what, what can we do within our churches going forward to get this conversation going, especially in parishes that are predominantly white? I would, I would say, um, you know, to, to engage, you know, sometimes some parishes have sister parishes that are in um, uh, different neighborhoods uh, engage, but don't just, don't just help out. You know, it's great, you know, help out monetarily, but also build relationships, authentic relationships, um, and, and, and try to hear someone else's story. Maybe there's people who are, are black Catholics in your own parish, uh, you know, without being weird, you know, like talk to them and say like, you know, what are some things that you think we can do? You know, solicit um, input from them so that we can make things a little bit different. Maybe they want to be a leader in some way, you know, like, hey, have you ever thought about being a lector? Invited are some things that, um, that, that you can do. Yeah. Father Josh had an interesting suggestion that I think is beautiful that oftentimes in a lot of these churches, a lot of the saints aren't showing the universality of the church, right? And so maybe petition your pastor, petition your parish council, hey, can we get an image of Our Lady Guadalupe in here? Can we get an image of, um, you know, Our Lady Cabejo or whatever it is, but just to kind of try to show the universality of the church so that way when people come who are different uh, races, they, they, feel, they feel welcome. They feel like, okay, this is a church that I belong to because I see somebody who looks like me over there. And, and like, if there's like 5,000 different Our Ladies, yeah. it's all right. Yeah. This is not a big deal, really. There's there's bigger problems in the world, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I and I think that just like in any family, there's always space for people, and our and our, our blessed mother loves it. Um, amen. Amen. Okay, so we got to do our last question here. All right. Who are some saints who give us a good example of the right way to deal with racial issues? Um, Saint, well, I'll start with one. Um, she's right there, Our Lady of Guadalupe and Saint Juan Diego. Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared in Mexico when there was huge racial division. Um, in fact, some historians say that there was about to be a revolt. And when she appeared, she in her in her image just completely beautifully, mystically, powerfully brought together two completely different worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and literally millions of people came into the church. And St. Juan Diego was her messenger. And he very faithfully, very humbly told the story of how Our Lady appeared to him to millions, being a witness for, 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 for so many indigenous people who needed someone to be their translator. So I would say Our Lady Guadalupe and St. Juan Diego. Yeah, I got a couple. St. Um, Josephine Baquita, she's a beautiful, beautiful saint. Um, specifically, she was a slave, but also she was tortured and, and brutally handled by her slavers. But she didn't allow that to not receive the gospel and not to see those that who actually tortured her as her brothers in Christ. And so it was just amazing, amazing um, witness of how to to look past color and to see once again human dignity in the person and um i'm gonna butcher the quote but she said as long as uh, i know that i'm good and, and like i know that god is good and i'm good therefore all is good 
once again, I butchered the quote. You can look it up. But uh, St. Josephine Bikita, I would say, definitely is a saint that we should turn to at these times. St. Peter Claver, uh, Pierre Toussaint. Um, um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Martin DePores. Martin DePores. Come on. Uh, yeah, there's... Buster there's... Cyprian Tansi. Like, there's... Yeah. I'm, I'm dropping names on you, bro. <laughs> you, you, you win. You win. Uh, no, there's... There's, uh, when we learn their stories, um, we see the beauty of the church. Right. And, um, and I don't know, bro, this, this conversation uh, in a time where there's so much craziness, so much vitriol, which means like, you yeah, know, I got you, thank you. Going on, it, this, this feels like this has been a, a, a peaceful blessing um, to somebody. We're talking about this because this is also a very important step that we got to take. Yeah, amen, amen. But now we got to take another step and, and finish up. Can I pray? Let's pray. Let's pray. Please. In the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for, for calling us to be present in this time. We give you thanks for giving us the faith, for giving us the strength, for giving us the ability to know you and your Son. But even more so than that, we just pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon us, upon a church, upon a people, upon a nation, um, so that we can be one. So we can be one as you have desired that you be one, that we be one in the Trinity. We pray, Lord, just through all the intercession of all the holy saints and angels, that any grace that we're in need of to overcome these differences would be given to us. That we would come to know and share in that love that you have in store for us. That we would see our brothers and sisters as you see them. That we would love them as you love them. And we would become more like you each day through your grace. And we ask this all to intercession of our ladies. We pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Follow our Mary. In the words of St. Francis, the Lord give me brothers. Love you guys. Thank you. Grateful for the opportunity to be here listen to you grateful for you guys joining me and that we could be here um together we're grateful for all of you who who joined us and um we're still in it we're still praying we're still talking we're still walking and we're grateful to be here with you um again we have something coming out every friday on ascension if you want to keep walking with us and um we're really grateful for your prayers really grateful for your kindness for listening to us and being here uh, god bless you all keep walking keep praying and we look forward to the day we'll all be one Amen. All right. God bless you. Peace.